So strategic agility Estonia style means that in 1991 you were a satellite country in the Soviet Union, but that today within one generation you're now known as E-Estonia, the most digitally advanced country in the European Union, if not the world. A big reason for that successful transformation is our first speaker this morning, Tavi Katka. After enjoying entrepreneurial success as CEO of one of the Baltic region's largest software development companies, in 2013, Tavi became Estonia's first ever chief information officer. He was charged with digitizing the government of a nation of over a million people, a challenge that was more than just a technical one, as he told The New Yorker magazine in 2017. He said, imagine that it's your task to build the Golden Gate Bridge. You have to change the whole way of thinking about society. Societal transformation through digital transformation. That's the kind of thinking that we like, isn't it? Now, South Beach is a ways from the Baltic Sea. So to make him feel a little more at home, let's offer a big Estonian good morning, or as they say it, Tere Homikusht. Did I get that right? Yeah, sort of. He'll say it for you to Tavi Katka. Big welcome. That's how it should be pronounced. <laughs> yeah, but it's a difficult language. Um, yeah, and thanks for the introduction. So uh, it's true, uh, I come from North Europe. Uh, like it's a latitude 59, which means it's Alaska. And uh, this is our summer, you can see on the screen. But it's a beautiful country, lots of forest and stuff. Uh, about myself, already was told that I'm an engineer, so I have built different uh, solutions all my life. Also built up a couple of companies, and yes, it was true, I was hired by the government. Uh, I was just, I just sold my shares and, and they said like, uh, I mean, Estonia is a small country, 1.3 million people, so we are all relatives, like, so we eat, all meet each other in funerals and weddings. And the government noticed that I might be unemployed and they said like, oh, why not you come and work for the government? And I said, I'm 33 and I'm perfectly healthy, so no way. <laughs> and then like, they were very persuasive and uh, I actually asked a couple of things. I asked um, a parking spot behind the government building because it's an old town and it's very few parking spots there. And the second thing I asked, full political support however crazy the ideas are, like just, you have to believe me. And two, I have to salute the Prime Minister and, and others, it was harder to get the parking spot. <laughs> and yes, we have done some remarkable stuff, I will share with you, and uh, so to start from somewhere, uh, I don't agree that, that it, change only happens if there is a great pain. And to understand the Estonian pain, uh, you have to understand our, our, our how say, location and some numbers. So uh, Estonia is 1.3 million people, uh, but land-wise, I mean, people-wise we are small, but land-wise we are huge. We are bigger than Switzerland, we are bigger than Netherlands, Belgium, like uh, Denmark. So the question is that, and we actually share the same pain what Finland and Sweden have, that outside of the capital, the average density is four person per square kilometer. So there's not enough people outside of the capital to serve other people. It's not economically wise to have a bank office in every small town. You have like four or five transactions per day, or like government officer in every village. I mean, it just, it just, I mean, you have to find a more, let's say, economically wise solution. So our idea was that, okay, let's start pushing people to use internet. Let's start pushing people to use computers, 
uh, not phones, because we started in the end of 1990s, and back then there wasn't any smartphones. And uh, let's focus on self-service. And it was obvious also that when you talk about digital society, it's not e-government. It's not that you push your service into the web and then, like, then people use it, or you build a government portal. Digital society is that the private sector and the government actually act together, and they build solutions together. So first solution would be, when you start pushing people to use computers, the first problem you have to solve is, who is behind the computer? How can I be sure that behind that phone or behind that screen is that John or that Michelle? You have to, I mean, how can I be sure? Maybe it's not John, maybe it's uh, Tom. So uh, we looked around and we have great neighbors. We have Sweden, we have Latvia, we have Finland, and the one who cannot be named. But, <laughs> But this one, I mean, we looked what Finland was doing, and then and, and Finland and Estonia is actually the like same. Finland was basically created a couple of months before Estonia. So Finland was, uh, they started as a republic in uh, 1917, uh, December, we started 1918 in February. So we are basically in, in the same age. But it always has been like an older brother, younger brother relationship. And we actually speak almost the same language. So uh, Finland has just invented an identity card, and uh, they have failed. I mean, they created it, but they failed. We copied it. This is 100% the same card what Finland had, but we added enormous innovation on top of that. We made it mandatory. So in many cases, if you want to change happen, and you know that there are like certain baseline needed to be built, it cannot be a voluntary thing. Like, you have to push it. Sometimes you have to make it in a way that like, the customers cannot say no. In our case, customers are the citizens. Another innovation we copied from Sweden is unique identifiers. So uh, you can picture, this is like actual document, you can picture this with me. That's my social security ID. The difference with you is that this social security ID is a public number. It's a name. So I'm not ashamed of my name. Why should I be ashamed of my digital name? The 379 is my digital name. It can be used by private sector and government sector both. Why it's important? As a software engineer, like one of the things we do, we, we connect data. And let's say if you have a bank, a customer in a bank and a customer in a tax authority, John Smith and John Smith. How can I say it's a St. John Smith? Just comparing the names? No. Name plus address? No. The only way is that if both systems use the same unique identifiers. And now the magic happens. If the healthcare, insurance, tax, finance, schools, education, everybody use the same unique identifiers about the objects, you can start instantly connect data between different systems. So for example, like if you want to make a change, you have to promise people something. We promised uh, the first, uh, I, think, I think it was in 2004, that we promised that, oh, declaring taxes is taking you one, two days. What if you can do and you can declare your taxes with three clicks? Like, duck, 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 declare. Do you want that? People said yes. <laughs> Do you know how many tax lawyers there is in Estonia? Well, there are in Estonia. Sorry, my English is not my first language. How many tax lawyers are in Estonia? <laughs> and that's not supreme. It's like zero. <laughs> zero. Like, what advice can you give me? Tick, tick, tick. The point is that like, what I have to do is I have to consent my bank to share my data with the government. If I'm willing to do that, the government gets automatically all my dividend incomes and uh, I don't know, like uh, my share transactions, like, like how much I, I earned, they can do the calculations. 
Uh, they can pull the information from the social ministry. They can pull information from other ministries and basically provide me pre-filled tax declaration. So I just need to review it and accept it. 96% of our nation declares tax electronically. 95% of that 96 doesn't change anything on the declaration, which means that they literally don't have to do any clicks at all. We could just send them an SMS saying that, oh, this year you have to pay like 2,000 more or like we will return you those extra money during the next five days if you don't act on top of this SMS. But we don't send that SMS. We still push them to go and interact with the government, do the free clicks because then they actually feel that they pay taxes. So that was how I first promised it was delivered and people liked it. And people, when people actually experience something good, they start demanding more. So one of the things we have like solved is voting. I mean, nobody likes to stand in queues and wait like, uh, like I mean, in, especially like in Miami, it's good like standing in the queues, but like in our weather, <laughs> minus 20 in average. <laughs> Actually, it's not the, I, I'm lying, it's, it's plus five in average, like, so uh, it's much warmer. But we started with electronic voting in 2005, and now I have to clarify, it's not that kind of electronic voting that you have here in the US. So it's not the machine in the corner. That's bullshit. <laughs> electronic voting is voting behind your computer whenever you locate. If I'm here in Miami, I can vote. If I'm in Japan, I can vote. If I'm home, I can vote. And more and more people like it. Yes, in the beginning it was more like youngsters, but now the statistics shows that elder people actually love it more. I mean, usually our votings are in March, and in March it's slippery and then people don't walk on the streets. And as you see, this year we reached almost 45% people voting over the internet. I mean, I know, I know, I know. You instantly have that problem, like so. If somebody votes over the internet, like how can I be sure it was a free vote? Because I can always take my gun and say, may I use you, vote for me. Like, and, I mean, I have to vote for you, you have a gun. But the beauty of voting or e-voting is that you can vote as many times as you like. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> it means always the last vote counts. So if I do to you, vote for me, and you vote for me, and then I leave, you vote again. So, and if you feel that I still push you too much, you can always go and vote physically. Or if I stand next to you with a gun until the e-voting ends, I'm only influencing one vote, which is not the problem. So, what I want to say with that is even with the like, simple, clear stuff that we have been doing for centuries, there are alternatives. And those alternatives might be good. I mean, the voting participation in Europe, it declines. People don't care. Thanks to the voting in Estonia, it has remained the sa like stable or even slightly like, like went up. So don't be afraid to think out new ways using technology. But I, I will come back to the Orwell thing. So after that, when we understood like, that we can be clear who is behind the computer or phone, what should be done? Like, so we started to create, like, we had like two goals. Seamless digital society and how to use data for very complicated tasks um, to solve. So first of all, like in every country, also in Estonia, we have silos. Minister of Interior, Minister of Social Affairs, Minister of Education, nobody talks with each other. Everybody has their own kingdom. That's my kingdom. And I will protect it with oil and what, what was the other thing? Yeah. So don't touch me. And I won't talk with you. Good. Actually, not good. I mean, when the child is born in Estonia, mother gets child support money. So uh, it's only 1.2, 1.3 million people, so we want to increase the 
population, so we paid to the mothers to have more children. <laughs> okay, that was bad. <laughs> okay, you get my point. So, so you want them, you want the silos to talk with each other because when the, when the mother gives a birth, like it, it used to be that then she went home and then she went to the local municipality, applied for her child support money, got the money. So that's bad. I mean, we are a digital country, we should digitalize it. So instead of going to municipality, the mother had to take the computer, log into the government portal, fill the forms, and uh, got the money. Hmm. But when the child is born, in Estonia, government names the baby. The government names the baby, and then parents have two weeks to name it, like, like John Smith or whatever you want to put. The government gives the number to the child. So if the government gives the number to the child, then the government knows that the child is born. Right? So we can automate. So what happen, how it happens now, it's like the child is born mostly in hospital. Uh, the nurse puts the information in the system. Population registry creates a new record about the newborn and relates that with the mother. Also triggers an algorithm in Minister of Social Affairs who actually own this knowledge how much money should be paid to the mother. But the payment depends on the salary of what mother got before the pregnancy. So who knows the salary of the mother? Tax and custom. So the algorithm asks from tax and custom, what was the salary of the mother? Tax and custom responds, they do the calculus, and now enter a task to the Minister of Finance, please pay out that amount of money to that mother. Okay, which bank account? Tax and custom, which bank account? Oh, mm -hmm. And it's fully automated, it's machine to machine. The only transaction, human transaction, was the nurse who registered the information that this new lady, this lady has this new baby. And that's a seamless society. So we don't want to go to government portals. We don't want to use e-services. If I can just like, if just things happen, the best service is no service. The problem with government services is actually people don't use them. How many times during your lifetime you apply for a construction permit? How many houses you're building during your lifetime? How many times do you apply for uh, child support money? How many times do you change your driving license? So the question is like, can you, uh, can you actually use a word pair user experience in e-government? Oh, I did it 10 years ago. I still remember how to do that. So there is no, I mean, there are like areas where, where user experience, I mean, it might be Apple or Google, but you can't make it smooth enough. And in those areas, seamless services are actually the best services. And that was an like, enlightening moment for us because we started to push those silos to talk with each other. And this is the scheme how it looks today. I mean, this we trolled for politicians because it looks, has to look good. That's a real picture. But it looks like a mess. But we actually know all the green dots here in this picture on all the black lines and that will save you from the details. Yeah, so if everything is connected, <laughs> there's a question like, how can you build a digital society without Big Brother? And it seems to be it's possible. And it has been done not only in Estonia, but also in, in, in Sweden, in uh, Finland, in Denmark, Norway. Yes, it hasn't been done in China, but like, at least in North Europe. And the way how you can do that, like, it's through transparency. So, I mean, let's think about seamless society. Let's think about healthcare. If something happens, let's say, something happens with me in South Estonia, I break a leg. And I get treated in South Estonia. But I live in North Estonia. So next week, I have to go to the North Estonian doctor, I mean, it would be nice if the doctor in North Estonia actually has the X-rays 
and everything that was done in South Estonia in front of her, right? Right, I mean, seamless service, perfect service. So why don't you have it in the US? Or you have it. Hospital shares data. Negative, okay, negative. In Estonia, positive. Because like, it's normal. And in Estonia, we made a rule, it's called once only rule, and that rule says that information cannot, can be collected from the citizen only once. So if one institution, it doesn't matter if it's hospital, department, ministry, whatever, one ministry, department, hospital has it, they have to share it with others on a need basis. So there has to be a need. And for me, as a, like, I'll say, as a patient, the way to control it is that I actually can see who has looked at my data. So if there is a doctor, I mean, doctor sees my data here in this picture, the first one is my lung doctor, the second one is my cardiologist, the third one is my family doctor, all good. So, no worries. If I see a name there that I cannot recognize, I can make a query why this person asked this information. If there is no reasonable explanation, this person gets fired. If the information is given to the third person, let's say journalist, start packing, you're going to jail. It's up to the judge for one year, up to three years, you will be in jail. We have had like the public spokesperson of Estonian police, a lady, sentenced, jailed, because she queried her boyfriend. So it's not, so it's not something funny, it's a serious thing, but on the same time, what you get? You get convenience for your people. People like that. I mean, I like that I can go to any doctor and without starting again, have you had measles? <laughs> no? Look it up. I mean, you get me, right? Like, information is good, if we, like sharing information is good if I, as a person, have a control over it. And that's the society you should build. So I'm like, you know that there's a GDPR, like a dragon in Europe. I'm a big fan, I'm a huge fan. My team was actually part of the team who wrote that. So, uh, because GDPR gives a right to share data and kind of control and right to be forgotten and all that kind of stuff. Because we generate information with every move we do. Even if we didn't move, we generate information. How much control you have over your Facebook data? Google, Apple? How much money you actually personally have earned selling your data? Physically. I mean, money on account. Not like, oh, Google is free because like, you share the data with Google. That, that's crap. <laughs> I mean, if they actually char start charging money for, uh, for using their search, I mean, instantly there will be a new Google. So that's the future, and, and it, it, it comes anyway. So uh, I already know that India is starting to copy the, the privacy laws and, and, and the, the approach what Europe has taken, and, uh, and, it's, and it's, it's a good trend. So we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. Great thing. Another part, when you start getting, if, when you get the like, systems connected with, with each other, the whole new world actually will be open. So to just give you some understanding how complicated questions we can answer in Estonia. I mean, let's take an economy. In the economy, normally government sees that there are small companies, tiny companies, big companies, large companies. And once per year, they, they give their numbers like in yearly books and then you can do some statistics and like basically that's it. You can't see the links between the company. Um, we asked our companies, I think 2014, uh, to basically fight against the VAT fraud and to create more equal market. Are you willing to share all your B2B deals with the government as an information? I mean, let's say I buy from you, so we both declare that we had a deal to the government. Are you willing to do that? And they said yes. And after that, we were able to create these kind of pictures. So this is the stone and gas industry. 
and you, you can see like the a bush, like red bush in the up, 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 upper, upper part of the picture. That's an invoice factory that we instantly can nail because now we have this information available and we see that, oh, there are hundreds of companies dealing only with one company. Hmm, why it's so? And we can send the, like I'll say, clerks in and then and, and, and them. We basically solved the VAT problem. Uh, the government budget increased like 2%. But also what we can see is that how money moved from one industry from, to another industry, how well our gas industry is doing, how well our chemical industry is doing. We can combine this with labor moves uh, on, the, on a daily basis. We can do this kind of predictions that there is an 80% probability that we might lose 3,000 jobs in East Estonia and chemical industry if we don't do anything. We can say that, like, we can basically measure how school absences have influenced your career. The five, fifth year, like, the curriculum, what you, what you had on, on, the, on the fifth grade, how it influences your salary in future. Or it, maybe there is no relationship. All this is available now. And the sad part is that there's only one country who is able to do the same thing at the moment in the world. And who is actually doing it? I'm just talking about it, like they actually do it. China. So that's where the governments are heading. And if they properly solve the transparency issue, I mean, there are enormous possibilities to understand like how to influence your economy. But, there are buts. The problem is that in Estonia we still have democracy. Uh, compared with China, means that uh, you have populists in the power, which means that for them this kind of thinking is rocket science. I mean, if somebody comes in and says there's an 80% probability that we might lose 3,000 jobs in East Estonia, East Estonia is not East Ukraine, but like, you get my point, not naming the neighbor, what to do? The instant answer is like, oh, Maybe we should, do, we should cut some taxes, like, like let, we, could, we should give them some kind of incentive, like. I mean, you might start dealing with a problem, like, in, in, a, in a wrong way. So that, that's why in Estonia we just talk about it. But in China, you know the social uh, rating system they have? If you behave badly, you can't buy airplane tickets anymore? That actually happened. Interesting. No legacy policy. My favorite. Your favorite. You still have those old systems, right? As an engineer, like you always know that one of the, your most, like how say, uh, your greatest enemy is legacy. Systems that were built 20 years ago, they didn't have any touch screens, voice recognition, AI. I mean, cybersecurity 15 years ago was piece of cake with cybersecurity that you face today. You replace your computer and your phone after every one, two, three years, right? Why don't you replace your IT systems? Because if it works, don't touch it? Right. So I made a rule. Uh, I couldn't cut it down too heavily, but in Estonia there was a rule. There cannot be any meaningful system that is older than 13 years. So if it's close to the 13 years, there is a principle that you have to start rewriting it. Even if it works, you have to rewrite it. What it also means is that the IT managers can start planning, and your financial officers also they start, can start planning that, oh, after the next six, seven years, those systems become old, so we need to replace them. So we need to start collecting money to make that change happen. And this means that you can actually be agile. And this means that you actually can build these kind of solutions that I showed to you. Because whenever you start from scratch again, when you rebuild stuff, you don't use the old thinking. You use the new thinking, plus you use the new technology. That's why it's so important to make the change happen. And why it's so important to be agile, I mean, oh sorry, just forgot to mention. Innovation for pain. There is no innovation without pain. It's always painful to somebody. In the year 2002, we forced all the teachers in Estonia to use e-school. 
you have to put your grades and next day topics and, and every, all the information you have to put in D school. And if you, like choosing two, I mean teachers with the classes pick like this, trying to put the numbers in. No, we won't do it. But in Estonia we still have democracy but we have this innovation for pain. So the headmaster says, okay, you won't do it, we, we, we don't pay you until it's done. The implementation took two months. <laughs> then the teachers ran out of money. And they had to do it. Like when you do e-prescription, when you do e-health, e-health is painful for doctors. It's much easier to do the, in the handwriting method. Why use iPad? It's always painful to somebody. But the benefits for the better goods, that basically, how say, they balance out the, the, the pain. So, ah, oh, yeah, I know, winter is almost over in Game of Thrones. <clears throat> Why Estonia is doing that? Yes, one thing was the pain thing, but another thing is that everything changes, and there is competition, and like I say, the countries are in constant war, not the physical war, but for example, in a war of talent. Who can attract the best companies and talent to come and be part of their economy? So, uh, and US has been doing a great job in, in that. So, and, and I mean, yesterday it was remembered to, do you remember how you bought music 20 years ago? No, it wasn't CDs, it was cassette and then CD. The cassette is yellow on the screen, the CD is red. When you bought your last CD, and remember, cassette was like, I mean, CD was a huge innovation. Cassette was, how can I get the B-side number two song? <laughs> no, 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 no. Change happened in less than 20 years. Are there any Finns in the audience? Good. Because this is... I like, always knew mock, mock, mocking on the neighbor's link. So um, this is the share of Nokia. In 2007, they were the like, largest smartphone company on earth, with less than five years from here to zero. I mean, how come they couldn't see that being the last, largest player on the market? With less than five years. So my challenge as a, as a CIO was that, can I make my country great again? No, it was, it was 2014, so it was way before. So, <laughs> just to remind you, we are 1.3 million nation. And though Estonia was actually a richer country than Finland or, 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 or Norway before Second World War. And we, we still remember those times. We were, we were the great ones. So, but... In government, as, as in, in private sector, like you want, if you want to make a country great again, you need more people to be connected with your economy. You need more people, so you need to grow. So 1.3 1, 1. to 10. Why 10? Uh, because Sweden is 9.6. <laughs> so, if you give an engineer, or if you're an engineer, and you take this challenge, okay, I need to get from 1.3 to 10. You start looking for options, and there are not too many options. First option, you can start doing babies. So I went to my wife <laughs> and said that I have this 10 million gold now. And she looked at me and said, like, you must be kidding me. Like, like it's an old picture, so now we have four children. Uh, two of them uh, actually with me here in Miami. Uh, so, it can be a solution, and it is a solution for many countries, but not for Estonia. We still have slightly negative birth rate. The other option is that you can just bring in more people. I mean, this has worked for you, it has worked for Germany, it has worked for UK. You can start increasing the population, just bring in people. In Estonia, we have a problem. Nobody wants to come. I mean, like, if you are in the latitude of Alaska, 
like plus five in average. And on the same latitude, you have like Norway, Sweden, Estonia. Loads of social benefits, loads of social benefits, no benefits. I mean, it's quite obvious, like even if they um, push to Estonia, they take the first ferry. I mean, last year we got seven. No, 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 not 7,000, 700,000, seven. In Europe, they have a quota. Every country has to take refugees, so we took seven families. They're all happily back in Germany now. <laughs> I mean, I can't blame them. I mean, like, uh, living in that environment, I mean, uh, like, it's dark, it's cold. Why? That's why we're actually so good in IT. I mean, we can't go outside, so we... <laughs> so, but, so... So if the Muhammad is not willing to come to the mountain, the mountain has to go to the Muhammad. So we invented this. Who says that you have to live in Estonia to be part of our economy? I mean, Apple is, belongs to what state? Where is Apple co Incorporated? In Delaware, right? So who owns, who owns Apple? California, Delaware? If I listen to Spotify, am I a citizen of Sweden? If I drive Uber, am I a citizen of US? If I drive Uber in Paris, am I a citizen of US? Can I use other country services living in my country? Can I buy Nutella? Kinder surprise? Can you be part of Estonia if you want to? Yes, you can. <laughs> Please join. <laughs> I mean, we have digitalized our country, which means that you can, when you have the magic card, when you have, like, actually, you don't need the card. Card is just representing that you have a digital identity because Digital identity is something virtual, and people have a hard understanding if you own something here, virtual, like Bitcoin. Like, nobody gets it. So, if you have a card, you understand you have like identity. So, you become an Estonian, you can digital sign, you can run your company from distance. I can live here in Miami and run my stuff in Estonia. No worries at all. If you want to do business in Europe, please do. And there are more and more people, like already mentioned in this conference, like digital nomads, people who actually don't serve customers in the same region, but they do it cross-border. Which is the best country to serve them? Just an example. Numbers are growing. So we are far from 10 million yet, but it's possible. So the fact that you're a citizen of your own country, but you are serving, but you are using services from other countries, it's actually totally normal. And if your taxes are paid here, what's the problem? And we don't tax you because you don't use our roads, you don't use our healthcare system, you don't use our education system. Why should we tax you? We just use our digital infrastructure. So that's a famous picture. There's a small add-on now. Think about it. Think outside of the box. Think how the thing should be. And then go to the engineer and say that, okay, this is a problem. This is how it should be. I don't know how to get there. But if you find a proper engineer, he or she will figure it out. Trust us. We have tried it. And obviously, please keep doing babies. <laughs> Thank you.